Okay, here we go. Now this palace has so many problems in it. Uh, these puzzles. Holy f***ing Atlas. There's a very high chance I could just straight up lose the battle. I don't even know what you're saying, dude. You have a freaking chair. What do you What do you think that's gonna do against us, huh? It's just a guy in a spacesuit with a fishbowl for a head. How did you get in the metaverse and how did she half awaken it? It's so weird to have this phantom thief just going to spaceship and steal a treasure. That is so weird and so random. This is bad. Are this is okay? bad. We need every second we can get. Oh, God. Everything is just a robot. What does this have to do with the mindset of Kunakazu Okumura? Why did they take up so much of the palace? So, uh, I like the palace now. All right, so let's see what the general consensus on this palace is, and we can... Oh! I have a lot of work cut out for me today, don't I? Ozzy. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no! So, one year ago, I made the video that will torment me for the rest of my life. Why Okumura's Palace is the Worst was a passion project of mine that I'd been planning for nearly two years, being inspired by many fantastic videos and channels, most blatantly Egoraptor sequelitis, if that wasn't obvious enough from a simple glance. My highest hopes were that, if I was lucky, I would gradually hit 10,000 views, maybe 50,000 if the world was really insane enough to give me a shot, and then, uh... Yeah, sorry about that. Still, time has passed, my editing skills have improved, and now, Persona 5 has gotten a little bit of an update. It's a little game, not sure if you heard about it. It's called Persona 5 Royal, and it blew my friggin' mind. P5R was a dream come true for me. You're telling me that my favorite game of all time, one that filled me with nothing short of pure artistic passion and adoration, was getting a definitive re-release with new content and improved gameplay? What is this, Persona 5 Crimson? Yeah, you guys remember that stupid guess of a name? Regardless, this game was everything I had hoped for and more. Graphical improvements galore, a revision to the combat that got me more addicted than ever, and new characters who the internet and I can fawn over? It was so much to take in. Yet, even before release, I had a few anxieties prodding my brain. What does this have to do with the mindset of Kunakazu Okumura? The anticipation was real. Still, even if the game was repackaged with a new flair, there was no way that it could really be that much better in the new version. Right? Right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you how Okumura's palace was royally fixed. Yes, fixed. You heard me correctly. And to explain why, let's start by- Talk about the boss fight! Huh? Oh, uh, be patient. It'll happen. Um, <laughs> anyways, let's go ahead and discuss the story. Alright, so unlike in my original video, this portion will be significantly shorter than the rest, because the plot itself is mostly unchanged. Hear me out though, because that doesn't mean I have nothing to say. I'm going to cover what's new, what's the same, and also, some misconceptions from my original video. 
Yes, I'm not perfect, and that video is flawed from the bottom up, so let's call this the royal version of that analysis, shall we? First off, I'm gonna rewind a tad from where that video began the discussion, because I feel like there's more context that deserves to be brought up. August rolls around in the game, and you've just recruited some gamer bait to your team in the form of Futaba. Everything is stellar, and feel-good, and happy, and fun, and happy, and exciting, and happy. But, as you notice pretty early on, Futaba takes on the role of the team's navigator, which was previously a spot reserved for Morgana. In fact, each new party member has gradually been overtaking Morgana's various roles in the fantasies, to the point that it slowly becomes unclear what his purpose is anymore. I mean, think about it. He starts as your relatively smart navigating mentor figure with pretty solid combat and support experience, but then Ryuji shows up as the brawn, Makoto replaces him as the brains, and potentially as the healer, Futaba replaces him as a navigator, and now that Yusuke is here, Morgana is no longer the weirdest guy in the room. But in all honesty, this buildup of insecurity is progressing through the entire game, and Royal especially takes advantage of the dialogue in order to convey this, with more instances of him using arrogant language to hide his inner anxieties. And of course, this all amounts to the beach scene with Futaba and the gang, where Ryuji directly calls out Morgana and insinuates that he's useless. Yes, the two bicker a lot, and it can be very taxing, but something to note is that both instigate it. However, in this circumstance, Ryuji's comment cuts deeper than anything else they've thrown at each other. All of this bubbling up of Morgana's insecurities, his only saving grace being whether or not he's a human, and therefore belongs with the group, is pretty well handled. This is where I need to re-clarify something from my last video. Morgana isn't a bad character. Not in the slightest, he's no more poorly written than someone like Yukari from Persona 3. So why did I rant about this in my original video? Well, because of, you know, that conversation. At the very least, I'm more admirable than some carnal blonde monkey. You little- This is what hurts the story. Not the build-up, not Morgana's character, but rather that Morgana's irrational anger here is so irrational in why he chose to argue this that it's hard to take it seriously. Is he wrong? Yes. Is Ryuji wrong? Yes. Both are absolutely acting like dumb teenagers here. So while the baseline for the arc is fine, my original issue was that the catalyst for the split itself was way too forced. <sighs> like I said before, flawed and irrational characters are fine to have in a story, but if handled wrong, then it can make things feel contrived. As we move along with the story though, a lot of issues from here basically surmount as nitpicks. Don't get me wrong, this is definitely the worst story arc in the game. But is it actually awful? Nah, not really. As much as it's hilarious to point out how Haru sneaks up on a cat, or how Haru commits vehicular manslaughter, or how Haru has a bunch of guns under her skirt- Do you ever actually stop to think about how insane that girl is? While I generally disagree with the middle of Morgana's arc being slotted in here of all places, it isn't the worst defense in the world, so this time we'll give the cat a pass. Okay, fine. I only like him now because he doesn't core for me to sleep anymore. Is that what you wanted to hear, Reddit? But yes, while the story's arc is the worst one in Persona 5 and wasn't really changed, this game's storytelling standards are most often stellar anyhow. Yes, Okumura himself is an incredibly generic antagonist, and Haru's arc being shafted by Morgana at the very end is undeniably moronic, but I still feel like this arc deserves some credit even if it's kind of annoying. Another aspect I feel obligated to cover, however, is a sheer mistake on my end. That being the symbolism of the palace. If you ever watched that video, I didn't shy away from letting you know that the palace should have been a factory and that it being a space station was a bad idea. And I was wrong. It took a lot of discussion, but I actually really appreciate the space theming now. So let's give that a bit of an analysis, shall we? First off, many people did get very heated in telling me I'm wrong, because as they put it, OBVIOUSLY THE SPACE STATION BECAUSE HE WANTED A SPACE TOY! I... I don't think these people understand how writing works. Also, what the frick was that voice I just pulled off? What the heck? Let's talk about Okuma and his toys, though. To put it as simply as possible, this dude grew up in an underprivileged household with no extra expenses for the things he wanted. As circumstances go, he eventually worked hard to be able to acquire whatever he desired. But that increase in power and his sense that he was entitled to compensation for what he'd missed in life would cause him to grow corrupt and take all feasible measures to gain as much power as possible. Thusly, he sees himself as above all other humans, his ego orbiting past the stratosphere like a space station. And as we see, Okumura's goal is to ascend even higher into the vast space of the political world, where his power could be limitless. Yeah, um, his rocket launch was just a bit botched. While it's still odd that this palace isn't set in a stereotypical heist location, 
maybe that's the point. You have to admit, it does feel a little uncanny and strange the first time you enter, as though something about this concept is inherently problematic. And no, that's not a symbolic excuse for the palace to be bad, stop saying that. So yes, it helps to set the tone that something about this arc is manufactured and wrong. But why space specifically? Well, simply put, in space, nobody can hear you scream. Nobody can help you if you're, I don't know, framed as murderers and are led into another palace by a secret antagonist who's planning to kill you and discredit your entire team. Moral of the story? You can be wrong sometimes, and I especially can be wrong sometimes. Don't take the opinion of Mr. YouTube Man so seriously, and feel free to think for yourselves once in a while, you know? Unless it's this video, of course. I, I'm begging you, please take my word for this. I promise I'm objectively right, trust me! Finally, we have to mention Haru, as well as Okumura himself. And while the rules are mostly the same, I have a few things to bring up once we get to the boss fight. I know the story discussion is ending a bit abruptly, but if I have to close out this segment with one last note, I still find it morbidly hilarious when Morgana gets punted. Okay, so I have no clue where to start with this. Talk about the boss fight! Not yet, we'll get there. I guess before we discuss the dungeon itself, I should get one thing out of the way. Yes, you still can't socialize for the week of Morgana's spring fling. That's already a mark off my respect for this arc, but to be fair, Royal Third Semester does the exact same thing and it's just as tedious. Basically, this shouldn't inherently ruin your investment in an arc, as long as the payoff is still worth it. Though obviously the story is a bit of a miss in this aspect, so uh... How is the gameplay fixed up? In all seriousness, a bulk of the original palace's problems were the fault of the game's mechanics and the dungeon's layout not complementing one another. Instead of incentivizing players to explore and sneak around, just as the movement options heavily leaned into with the palaces prior, the space station instead opted to go the route of Final Fantasy XIII and to have the palace consist of straight labyrinthian hallways that never end. In Royal, however, it was clear that Atlas realized where they'd stumbled and how they could fix it. Story-wise, they couldn't fix a ton without restructuring a bulk of the story, and since the arc is still serviceable, they didn't touch much. But regarding the palace, that's a whole different can of worms. Let's start by addressing the elephant in the room. Yes, I am talking about Gear Mikawa, actually. The minimal variation in terms of enemy weaknesses and strengths is still present, but most still have the ability to cripple any physical attack sent their way. Yet, this is no longer much of an issue. But why? Well, several factors have changed in Royal that make this facet easy to work around, and these fixes are integral to how this palace as a whole is fixed. First of all, as is tradition with most palaces, the new party member's element is a common weakness for the majority of Shadows, in this instance being Psy abilities. This applied to vanilla P5, but there was one simple problem. Haru literally couldn't access Baton Pass while you were in the palace. For those of you who haven't played the original version of Persona 5, Baton Pass used to be locked behind a party member's second confidant rank. While sometimes you could rank up those characters while still in the palace, more often than not, your new thief was inaccessible to socialize with. It mainly just served as a handicap that made the new party members kinda useless for chaining attacks together, leaving either that party member or Joker himself to drain their SP reserves and to carry the entire party on their shoulders. Yeah, the good old days of Ryuji having 180 SP when I have 12. I thought you were my bro, just share a bit. Of course, now baton passes are granted from the get-go, and since the mechanic has actually been buffed up so that each subsequent pass gets more and more powerful, never has it been easier to quickly take down enemies. But wait, there's more. That alone was already a massive fix, but here swoops in Royal with two of my favorite new additions, those being accessories that allow party members to harness new attacks, as well as technical attacks and ailments being amped up to better flow in battle. Now you can have On put a dude to sleep, Haru punches them and gets a one more due to the technical strike, she uses a Psy attack to knock another one down, she passes to Makoto who has a fancy little ring that lets you use X-Men brain powers to shatter their concept of reality, 
and Joker swoops in with myriad truths because you're a dirty cheater. Bam, done, enemies obliterated all in the span of 10 seconds. It's fun as heck and this is only possible in Royal. This alone already makes SP management a dream in this palace and every other palace for that matter. Though, of course, this is still on top of the fact that you're forced into constant enemy encounters, right? WRONG! So here's a fun fact about P5R. When your security level reaches 100, you don't get kicked out from the palace. Rather, security itself simply amps up, meaning enemies can spot you faster, but you have a higher chance of spotting treasure demons. That's right, long gone are the days of being constantly anxious about how high your security level is. Just tackle the palace however you like and suffer the consequences as they come. If you're not sneaky, you'll have to fight more enemies. The perfect trade-off. But Ozzy, how can we be sneaky if it's all just narrow hallways? Rest easy, my disturbed disciples. There are, once again, multiple changes that solve this complaint. First and foremost, the palace structure itself has been reworked. Thank the Lord! There have not only been an increase of blockades to hide behind in some select areas, but multiple areas have been totally reorganized to better complement free movement, stealth, and or simply streamlining things so that they're not pointlessly stretched out. Remember this old robot puzzle that used to have three loading zones and was needlessly stretched out across mile-long corridors? Now it's just two straight lines. There are still a good couple of areas that are relegated to tight pathways, but it's much less severe than it used to be. However, is there a way to work around those moments where cover is scarce and there's little room for movement? In comes our backup solution. If you've been blessed enough to spend time with the adorable dumpling that is Kasumi Yoshizawa, then fret not, you now have a grappling hook. Just fling yourself at speeds that MatPat would shake his head at, and take down the fiends from a respectable distance. Yes, you still have to fight these enemies, but not only are battles easier now, and this makes it simpler to get the upper hand in even more scenarios, but you also have a chance to inflict ailments upon the start of the battle, meaning you can land the technical baton pass, hit the weakness, baton pass, dead. Also, I forgot to mention showtimes, which ensures you kill shadows even faster, and I forgot to mention showtimes! How do you not mention showtimes in a P5R video? That's it, I'm firing whoever wrote this script. Um, I wrote it. I wrote the script. Also, I know I skipped over it a tad, but going back to that robot puzzle, that also encapsulates a major fix in the gameplay loop. Before, you would go up to each of them, ask them about their day in order to figure out if they had a keycard, they would call you a nerd, and then you'd duke it out to see if they're who you were seeking out. It was tedious and a little boring, especially since each was just another pompous robot at the end of the day. However, Royal made a completely unexpected and super entertaining shift in how this puzzle works. Asking if they like chocolate? Nah, that's irrelevant to the point of the palace. Now, each robot shows the truth of such a greedy and corrupt environment, the lower units complaining about their superiors to the point that they not only tell you the traits of the next mini-boss so you can figure out who they are, but they even tell you their boss's weakness and I adore this touch so much! This turned a once menial puzzle that I constantly dreaded, well, into one of my favorite moments in the entirety of my playthrough. It's infinitely more engaging, a hilarious twist on the prior formula, it actually reflects on Okumura since, if this is how his lower units act, he must be even more extreme than this, and all of these changes in the dynamic actually gives the robots a personality that makes fighting through them much less arduous. Plus, you know, cite the earlier gameplay changes and bada bing bada boom, the robots die quick and easy. In terms of major fixes, most of the other puzzles remained relatively the same, though they actually have an added bonus thrown in as well. This is where we finally introduce my favorite new palace feature, that being Will Seeds. These little goodies are often hidden off to the side of dungeons and are a nice little incentive for allowing players to explore each crevice of the palaces. It's no longer simply a straight line to the goal, but rather feels like you're actually exploring a massive construct. The ones within Okumura's palace aren't anything too insanely special compared to the rest, but they still add a breath of fresh air to each section of the palace, and it once again serves to improve engagement, as well as giving you some extra SP for your entire party. You know, in case you were still somehow running low on the resource despite all the changes. Oh, and tiny note, but the grappling hook as a transportation tool is used pretty frequently in this palace in particular, and the palace actually includes my favorite grappling hook moment in the entire game, <coughs> not including checkmate. Which is not only a decently well-hidden secret, but is incredibly rewarding for those who actually find it. Late edition, I forgot to mention, but the vent puzzles were also streamlined in Royal, so yeah, you can stop complaining now. Finally, there's the music, which is the same. But hey, in its defense, Sweatshop is far from a terrible song. It's aggravating when it's played for three or so hours, but the palace is no longer that long anyways. Almost everything in this palace has now been rebalanced, restructured, and optimized in a way that's not only much more fair and well-designed, but it's just fun to explore now. 
So that's it. No more to discuss. Everything was fixed. We can move on and talk, talk about, about the boss fight. fight. <sighs> Fine. You want to know my honest thoughts on this godforsaken fight that you all keep yelling about? It's one of my favorite fights in the entire game. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> This is where all my credibility as an analyst is thrown away, huh? Never thought I'd be defending this thorough looking creep, but here we are. Just as preemptive reassurance, this is all just my opinion. It's not law, I'm simply a YouTuber and a Persona fan, and I'm just giving my take on how the boss fight made me feel. That doesn't invalidate your- wait, what? What is that? My channel's opinions are absolute! Huh? Why are you here? What the heck even are you- My channel's opinions are absolute! Oh... I'm just gonna ignore that. But yeah, I'm aware that regardless of what I say here, the vast majority of people will disagree with me and call me an idiot since their broken controllers likely speak for themselves. Meaning I have nothing to fear and can just stomp on the eggshells beneath me. For those who agree with this, enjoy your validation. And for those who don't, I hope I can still entertain you with my garbage takes. So, you wanna talk about a great boss fight? Let's talk about a great boss fight. First, I never went into much detail on the original fight in my first video, but let's compare, shall we? In Persona 5, you encounter Okumura, the first boss who has no form of alternative distortion. Odd, but he instead has his robots do his dirty work for him, befitting of the theme. It's almost identical to prior mini-bosses, though, being pretty blatantly easy as he just drops robots in front of you until he sends out his last minion. Unlike the rest, this one has no weakness, but has an attack which basically kills your entire party unless you block. It does heal party members inflicted with hunger, but generally speaking, it's just a kill move that stalls a turn. There's also a timer, which nobody ever lost to. There's no way that someone legitimately spent more than 10 minutes on this particular fight. But I'm sorry if you're the one person who somehow did, then in this case, this is a really mean call out, I'm sorry. That's it though. That's the entire old fight. So let's analyze how- There are no flaws in Ozzy's logic! Would you cut that out?! Looking at Royal, the format seems pretty identical at first. Okumura drops four robots and a timer for 30 minutes is set. The only difference is with Haru, who now has a cognitive robo-slave doppelganger standing on her father's side. Once you start fighting, however, you'll notice that after two turns, if you haven't killed every robot in front of you, they run screaming and are replaced by identical units. This is the fight's main gimmick, and say what you want about it, but I love it. Let's be real, Persona 5 Royal is ridiculously easy. Once you leave Kamashita's palace, the game's challenge practically gets launched into orbit, never to be seen again. However, this finally gives an opportunity to flex your brain muscles and use all the tools in your arsenal to take them down as fast as possible. Heck, with every new function they added, this should be a cinch. So you knock every enemy down, and you can't all out attack. And honestly, I can see why this pissed off a lot of people. You know, you're used to that pattern of turning off your brain and doing the big kill move. It's simple and natural for your noggin at this point, but that's been taken away from you all of a sudden. To play devil's advocate, however, since when have you had the option to all-out attack during a boss fight? I know this is a very different circumstance from most other bosses, since you've never been able to knock them down in this fashion before now, but for me, boss fights are a break in taste from the normal battle formula, so I never really expected to be able to. That's still no major defense of that handicap, since the game could convey this change way better, but here's a quick rebuttal. Just adapt. Yes, it's a bummer that you lost your insta-win button, I get it, but this is a boss fight, something you should savor and feel challenged by. One missing function shouldn't utterly shatter your enjoyment of a fight. Though, on that note, let's discuss the real major reasons why people hate this fight. So you go through the different ways, and they're generally pretty easy. When you get to the tall blue bots, Robaharu starts to buff individual robots so that it's much harder to keep a simple pattern of killing them all at once. It's an amp in the difficulty, so it doesn't get stale and repetitive. And then, there are the green robots. Ladies and gents, these aren't that hard. 
Honestly, they just hit slightly harder than the robots before them. And beyond that, their only major difference is having a self-destruct function, which, if you're doing the fight properly and actually taking down those waves, it's not going to activate in time to hurt you. Yes, it's challenging. Two turns to kill four enemies while on a time limit is kind of wild. Actually, can we talk about that time limit for a second? Think about it. You're on a timer. You need to get multiple tasks done, but if you mess up, you'll have to start from scratch on one or more parts, and the pressure is on. You're worn out, and just looking at that clock is just a distraction that's overwhelming you and causing your failures to increase every single time. This type of anxiety is crippling. This is just the mindset of a minimal wage employee! Finally, some symbolism in this palace that's actually clever and meaningful! I adore this! But yeah, the obvious advice for this fight is... Ignore the timer. It solves nothing to stress yourself out by obsessing over it. These phases are challenging, but are far, far from impossible. Even beyond that, you can literally see who they'll target due to Okumura's shockingly hilarious demands and insults towards your party. So, resource management should be reasonable. So, just focus, and you can take them down, no problem. And then a BIG boy shows up once you finally kill those guys. Okumura's top CEO. He's mostly the same as in Vanilla P5, which makes him a somewhat boring finale, but it also means he's pretty easy, so you just power through him and... Oh, it's not over, is it? Robo-Haru swoops in as the final servant at Okumura's disposal, showing his complete lack of care for his own daughter. He will quite literally sacrifice anyone and any semblance of humanity in order to achieve his desired power, and it shows with the cold exterior of his daughter's doppelganger. She's not much more powerful than the prior robot, but she's given one final order when things look dire. Self-destruct. I'm sorry to gush, especially about a fight that I know made so many people actually throw their controllers, but this simple lineup of changes made this fight so amazing to experience. This detached, smarmy piece of garbage sending his own workers to the slaughter, each one running in a panic once they're at their breaking point with an inkling of life left. Even his most loyal units can't help but flee in terror at their disposable nature once things reach their last breath. And when it finally comes to his daughter, he won't hesitate to quite literally sacrifice her life in order to get what he wants. This fight has character, stakes, a clear narrative thread, and it finally causes players to think through their actions and decisions in order to overcome this mechanically convoluted setup. I had already shockingly enjoyed the palace up to this point, but this fight had sealed my enjoyment of Royal's Okumura Palace. If this fight was a struggle for you and you raged uncontrollably, I can sympathize with you. But for me personally, having played on hard, which is technically the hardest difficulty for this fight, but I'll explain that in a second, having not prepared any personas or items beforehand, and obviously having no clue what the fight would be like, I thoroughly enjoyed the battle. It, no joke, is one of my favorite boss fights in the entirety of Persona as a whole. So yeah, ride all you want, but the moment I powered through all those waves and got to bonk Okumura over the head with a sledgehammer, it actually felt satisfying and rewarding. Also, the fight isn't actually that hard anyways. So, you want to beat Okumura, eh? I've been there, fellow. Of course, doing any basic task is difficult if you don't have an instruction manual and refuse to experiment with new solutions and strategies, so... Eh, what the heck? Here's all you need to know on how to wall up this hunk of junk and... Okay, I'm gonna stop talking like that now. Step 1. Switch the game to Merciless. This causes players to dish out 3 times technical damage, meaning if you handle the battle correctly, you'll never get hit. As stated by the developers themselves, hard is actually the hardest difficulty, which is odd, but blame the difficulty balancing for being broken, not the boss itself. That wouldn't make any sense. Step 2. Equip Ryuji, Morgana, and Haru to your party. This covers all your bases and hits every possible weakness that each robot will have, plus it'll keep you healed and doing constant damage. Step 3. Use buffs. Don't be stubborn. Buffs are your best friend. If you really want to give yourself an easy run, just take the dive and fuse personas who can buff or debuff defense and or attack stats. Step 4. Don't default to using spells that hit every enemy. You gain no benefit from knocking them all down fast. Go to the party member who has the correct spell, use a single hitting spell, and attack three of them individually before using an all hitter. If you can chain to other party members who can hit weaknesses, even better. And if one unit is buffed, make sure to save your strongest attack for them. 
With this pattern, you can optimize damage across the board before knocking them down. Furthermore, if you're hitting them all individually, make sure to not attack the buff unit last, as you want them to be receiving the most damage out of the wave. Basically, you want to be hitting them twice in one go. Step 5. Use Triple Down Haru's Triple Down attack is fantastic and does tons of damage. Once everyone is down, pass to her if you can and give them health. Of course, if you already have better damage options that you know will be consistent for you, go ahead with those. This pattern will basically always take down enemy waves without fail. Step 6. Remember to heal. This is common sense. Also, don't be scared to use items to buff and heal. Hoarding items in an RPG is almost always a terrible idea. If you think you need them, just use them. Step 7. Stay smart. On the final two enemies, they break the pattern and act like normal tanky enemies. Just keep yourself alive and deal as much quick damage as possible. If Robo Haru is about to explode, risk it all. Buff up as much attack as you feel reasonable and obliterate her. Step 8. Slap Okumura. You won. Go home. This boss took me about 7 tries to beat. It was definitely a challenge at first, but like any good boss, you have to adapt until you reach mastery. And using a method similar to this, but even harder to pull off, I managed to scrape by with 22 minutes still left on the clock. It's really not that bad. You just have to think for once, but we all know Persona fans, right? <laughs> Seriously, it's not that bad, just use your brain. So that was incredibly defensive and long-winded, but even if you still disagree, I hope you at least understand my perspective on this boss. And with that, let's head on off to my final conclusions. Okumura friggin' sucks! Or, well, he used to. This palace is incredibly far from perfect. I would have no qualms with those who still consider it the worst palace experience offered by P5. Heck, I ranted about my gripes with that palace for nearly an hour. I have no preconceived positive bias towards this mess. The story arc is a bit subpar, the palace itself can be arduous and exhausting for some, and the boss fight ripped away the sanity of millions. But. I couldn't help but find an immense amount of charm and enjoyment in the new revisions. Yeah, uh, the infamous Okumura hater now simps for the man. Who would've guessed? P5 Royal was a treat, through and through. It's flawed, but my biggest gripes all boil down to nitpicks. As I stated before though, the pile of creative and clever changes made to the gameplay loop turned an already masterful game into one of legends, and Okumura's palace isn't the exception to that rule anymore. So yeah. For all intents and purposes, at least in my eyes, Okumura's palace was fixed by Persona 5 Royal, and I couldn't be more glad. And now I simply await the mob of destruction I've incited to tear me apart once this uploads. So, uh, y'all like Persona? Oh gosh! Jeez, that was hectic. But. Finally, I was able to put out my thoughts on this topic. I know I left you guys hanging there for a bit since this was meant to release on June 28th, which is both my birthday and the anniversary of my first video, and that was a month and a half ago, but here we are. New viewers don't care about any of this info though, so it's all fine. Still, it's terrifying releasing a video that you already know is going to be flooded with disagreement from the majority of a fan base. so fingers crossed that it was worth it. Moving on though, first and foremost, I just started a Patreon. It's been a long time coming, and I was pretty nervous about it, but I'm trying my best to make it worth your while, so if you love my content, it would mean the world to me if you checked all that out. Making a career out of this seems like a far off dream, but who knows? Also, you may have noticed that season 1 text at the end of this video. That's basically just my personal way of categorizing the different phases of this channel, and season 2 is definitely going to be a big change. For better or for worse, we'll see. I'm planning on getting videos out faster, which will mean the editing may be a little less intricate on the majority of videos, but I'll keep the scripts and substance of them at the same quality, if not higher than before. I also may or may not review Persona 1 through 5 as well as doing character analysis of P5 characters, as well as doing some different anime and video game topics outside of Persona, but who knows, right? Yeah, this next year is gonna be wild. We already hit 10k subs by the time I was making this video though, and that's an insane milestone for someone who'd only uploaded 6 videos at the time. I honestly can't thank you guys enough, and I hope you stick with me for as long as I'm actually entertaining. But yeah, with those announcements out of the way, and all the rambling done, it's time I share some things. 
I've gotta send some love to both Signorish and Meluigi, the first being an awesome person who's let me force them into a few too many videos. They do Twitch streams semi-regularly, and I appear in them when possible, but they're already super entertaining with or without me, so tune in for those. Then there's Chi, who's just been super helpful in giving advice and being supportive, and is the genius behind my palace ranking thumbnail, so give him credit where it's due. Speaking of credit, special shoutouts to Doomy Mood, who was extremely generous in helping do the art for that awesome tutorial sequence. Seriously, they're extremely underrated, so go check out their stuff. Thanks also go out to Manga Common, The Fourth Snake, as well as Adam Haydell, all three being YouTubers who I've been longtime fans of before I even started this channel, and were all kind enough to send some shoutouts my way. I never asked any of you for that, but it means a lot. Check out their content if you like. Then just some quick thanks to both Sonic Kick and Codex Entry, two incredibly underrated YouTubers who have just been cool guys to me as long as I've gotten to talk with them. Make sure to check them out as well. Love also goes out to Skull from the fansite and Spencer from Shimigami Tensei Network. Both of you have been incredibly supportive and great friends, and I have to thank you for making me feel like I truly belong in this community. It means more than you can imagine. And last but not least, you may have noticed that I have a new profile picture now, and courtesy goes to Cathonicus, a longtime friend who's probably the most underappreciated artist I've ever met. Seriously, this guy is good. He also nearly drew the avatars for the original Akumura video, but clearly my stick figures are better, so I had to go with those. Also, he was a bit busy, so I settled on my placeholder art. But he's fantastic, so look out for more of his work. While I did love the old profile picture, this one definitely fits the channel better and is just nicer looking. So I hope you guys don't mind the change. But yeah, I think that covers everything. I'm excited for what's to come, and I hope you all join me on that journey because I have ideas abound for the future. It almost feels like my chains have finally been shattered. Just over a year ago, I was just a high schooler with no vision for his future beyond a passion for writing and all forms of art. Yet, here we are now. It's insane. I won't ramble for any longer, though, I promise. Thanks for watching, and remember, stay safe, comment why I'm wrong, and wear your friggin' mask. It's important.